I went to Trape Academy, um, played football, basketball, baseball. If you could throw it, catch it, run it, I did it. And that was my first passion in life, staying true to my Greek, my Greek roots. You know, it's, it's philosophy, pol uh, politics, and athletics. And there's a little bit of a nexus there, I think, as well, between all those things. We can get into that stuff later. But um, I did come to Colby College for a recruiting visit once. Uh, the football team wasn't really flourishing at the time. <laughs> so anyway, I actually went on to the University of Maine where I played, um, I played four years. I came as a walk-on and earned myself a full scholarship. Um, I still have coaches around that are available and uh, some are in the NFL. One called me last week. He's the coach for the New Orleans Saints, or at least assistant coach for the New Orleans Saints. And he said, I remember Dean Scott was in college. If anybody in Maine has a question about his character or his work ethic, you tell him to call me. So if you guys want that number, I'll help him give you a call. <laughs> but I think it's important to Mainers as well to know this is a local guy who's kind of done good, a local kid. Um, you know, along the way, I've had people remember me from junior high and Pop Warner football. So that's very much a part of my past. Um, and I'm proud about that. And I think it's, it's consistent with a lot of the values of Mainers that you grew up here, you played sports, and uh, went to the University of Maine as well. Maine's largest block of voters are unenrolled voters, independent voters. And the typical response to that is people think that, oh, they're, they're moderate. And that's not true. Actually, if you look, them on, look at them on a political spectrum, they're equally as isolated. They tend to identify with conservative values or liberal values. The big difference is they vote for people. And they vote for character. And it goes a long way in the state if you can go into somebody's you know, uh, porch or living room and say, hey, I'm Dean Scotchers. My dad grew up here in Old Orchard Beach, and this is who I am. And they can turn around and say, you know what, I disagree with you politically, but I like you. And that's what it really means about being a spirit of an independent here in Maine. And I think it's, it's an advantage for me, having been in my family in the state for so long, people know who you are. And it continues to happen. Probably one of the best political assets I have is people say, I know your brother. I used to work with him, or I know your dad. Um, and now it's extended to my nieces and nephews, and hopefully soon my children as well. We're the United States of America. We can do it both. We can get everybody access, right? But name one program the federal government has ever done better than private enterprise. Why are we turning to the federal government to provide a health care system? I mean, the entrepreneurship, the innovation is here in our constituency. All the government needs to do is get out of, a, get out of the way. You know, you'd have to have some kind of requirement that all doctors or all health care providers come online with standard space, non-proprietary systems by a certain time. I think, at least the way I've spoke about it, which is there's a large correlation between quality health care and actually health care cost as we take paper um, records and put them onto to hard drives, so to speak. And that becomes, um, obviously, with, with digital data, the response time between you and I, and if you got sick and I didn't have your medical records and I gave you the wrong medicine, um, you know, something could happen, then we might have a lawsuit to follow, and that, that goes down dramatically. Uh, a second really nice feature of digitization of healthcare records is that you can now create risk pools where people need to be screened at a certain age because of their genetic background or because of their participation, and uh, you can actually start calling, cross-pollinating that, and then you can actually start treating chronic disease pre uh, preventatively uh, years before. So I think that's, uh, that's the attraction piece to me. And I think the only way the federal government can do that is somehow, as they do other stuff, require that all health care providers be standards-based uh, by a certain date. I'm a firm believer that um, business will go where it's easiest to do business um, and everything else will follow. The investment dollars will follow, the resources will follow, the talents will follow. If you look at Maine, right, you know, Forbes ranked us 48. I don't know who 49 and 50 were, but, you know, it's not a, not a good place to be. I know that from my athletic experience that if you're running around saying I'm number 48, something's <laughs> wrong. So, but I think, uh, you know, as, as the President of uh, Israel said, is that uh, economies do what governments can't, and the first step is reduction in taxes. I think the biggest challenge is when I face my competitors is they come out, oh, those tax cuts are for the wealthy, and they're for the rich, and it doesn't matter. Well, look what it's done to Maine. I mean, I see it. I see an environment, I was brought up in here in Maine, where people were self-reliant, and now they're relying upon the state, right? Um, that's, that's, that's the bad way to, to mold an economy. And we've got it upside down. And as that continues to go upside down, you've got a very small population, the wealth-earning population, the businesses supporting the rest of the population. That cycle's got to stop.
I think there's actually critical mass within the state now to say, yeah, Dean's right. What he's talking about is right. We're self-reliant people. We just need lower taxes so the business can come in. Geographically, we, we know, like I said before about India, it doesn't matter. People have access right now in the global economy. You can do anything. Uh, you can participate in building software, open source code. You can do anything. You can, I mean, we're getting to the point where labs won't need wet labs anymore because you can uh, uh, replicate the, the genes required and you can have a, a, a collaborative workforce across the globe. Access is important, but I guarantee you investment will come if taxes are lower. You know, the ideas are out there. And sometimes, you know, companies, if you watched the Super Bowl last year, uh, they asked customers to make the commercials. And they were actually better. So it's getting that idea to Washington, D.C. It's like, you know what? The ideas don't come from within the Beltway. They come from people who develop things like open source code and technology. And you task them with something like a technical core and say, this is the problem I want you to resolve. Build me a system for it. And I think, and I had a, a nice conversation with an executive from Bank of America yesterday. I think in your job and your future, and certainly in mine, which I find exciting about it, is IT, information technology, is going to be a requirement for you to do any job in the future. And government's been very reluctant to do it. I mean, think about the footprint and the size and the capital cost of keeping those buildings open alone. You know, we know for a fact you don't have to be in the same building to get an administrative job done anymore. JetBlue doesn't do it. JetBlue outsources all their jobs to moms who work at home. And husbands, I guess, if they want them. But, yeah. um, but the point is, is that, you know, let's look at the cost on paper. Let's look at the way the government accounts. They've imposed Sarbanes-Oxley on, on, the, on the commercial enterprise, and, and the reality is they can't account their, themselves. And they don't know how many uh, consultants they got in the Department of Agriculture. You know, when you hear that the federal government's made a cut, they haven't made a cut. They just reduced the increase that a certain agency was supposed to get over year after year. I say make them apply and live by the same standards that we do. So I, I truly, I, I really am doing this from a reform-minded spirit. I mean, you're not going to see probably a campaign or a candidate who comes at this the way Republicans have traditionally come at it. And that's why I call myself a next-generation Republican. I take all the things Reagan did and I put a younger face on it, maybe some newer ideas. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to anybody that I am that, that caliber person. But if the, if the party, especially here in the state, doesn't change or refuses to start being the, poly, uh, the party of innovation and ideas, it's going to, uh, God rest its soul.